Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Tonight I'm uh, beginning a new study, uh, the book of Ecclesiastes. I'm very excited about uh, really taking a good look at this book. And I, I probably will learn a lot myself as I go through it. I haven't really focused on this book much uh, in uh, the last 29 years. Uh, I have read it, of course, uh, several times, but uh, I'm going to really attempt to really get as much out of it as I can. I, I hope uh, you do, too. Um, the reason I'm able to start, start this night is because I've just recently completed a few of the other studies that we've been working on. Uh, the, the book of Job is done, so I hope you go watch that, the, the, all 42 chapters. I completed the uh, study and teaching on early church history and the one on uh, uh, church creeds and early church heresies. So I hope you go and watch all of those. And now we have a little time to begin a new study. Uh, I'm a KJV firstist, so I always read it in the KJV first, but I'll probably look at also in the Amplified. Sometimes I find that helpful. So let's begin right now. And the first thing I guess we need to establish is that this was written by King Solomon. He's also the one that wrote the book of Proverbs. And right now, in the study of the book of Proverbs, I think I'm in chapter 27, 27 out of 31. So we're almost finished with the book of Proverbs too. So the interesting thing is, uh, he wrote the book of Proverbs uh, to teach his son wisdom. That's what he states in the beginning of the book. Um, and we get an amazing amount of wisdom from studying Proverbs. And yet, King Solomon, uh, like all of the other main characters in the scriptures, um, I shouldn't say all, I can only, I can, of course, Jesus had no flaws. The Apostle John, I don't see anything in ever written about the Apostle John that was uh, negative. Uh, but Moses was a murderer. Uh, the Apostle Paul uh, was a, a, a murderer. Uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all liars. Uh, David was a murderer and an adulterer. So even the greatest figures throughout biblical history, all these great characters, uh, they certainly had a lot of flaws too. And sure enough, King Solomon, even though he gave us the book of Proverbs, he also, at the end of his life, near the end of his life, I believe is when he wrote Ecclesiastes, reflecting on his life and his mistakes. Uh, he was so wise, he was considered to be the wisest man in the world. And, and yet, uh, later on in his life, he getting got involved in pagan religions and uh, he made a lot of big mistakes. So even the wisest man doesn't always practice wisdom. So let's begin with the study of Ecclesiastes now. Verse, chapter 1, verse 1. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Uh, so he's going to preach to us. He's uh, preached uh, in the past, preaching about wisdom in the book of Proverbs. And he is the son of David, King David. Uh, Solomon was the heir, the, the king after David. Uh, and in the Amplified, it says, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. So there's no difference there. Verse 2, vanity of vanities, saith the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Well, this uh, very first statement here is basically going to be the theme of this entire book of Ecclesiastes. Um, and I think you'll understand that uh, this not only introduces the book and the, the, the main th theme of the book, uh, but this will be the theme throughout this whole book of of uh, Ecclesiastes, that everything is vanity. So in the Amplified, it says, 
Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All that is done without God's guidance is vanity. Futile, meaningless, a wisp of smoke, a vapor that vanishes, merely chasing the wind. Now, one of the reasons uh, I read the Amplified is because it amplifies the scriptures. And really, that's what I'm doing in, in this study, this teaching. Uh, all, of, all of my teaching videos, uh, I am amplifying the scriptures. I'm expounding on the scriptures uh, based upon how I see it, uh, trying to be helpful to you, to help you understand. And the Amplified Translation is these these writers, these translators, they're amplifying. They're, they're, it's like they're sitting down with us and explaining what the verse means in their words. So uh, that's why I think it uh, can be very helpful. But so the difference, of course, here is that it kind of explains to us what vanity of vanities is. It says, all that is done without God's guidance. So if you're going through life, no matter what you do, if it's not based upon God guiding you, it's just vanity. And that means that it's futile. Vanity or vain, it means it's futile, it's meaningless. A wisp of smoke, a vapor that vanishes, merely chasing the wind. These are beautiful pictures of something that is just meaningless. That's what he means by vanity. <clears throat> Let's go to verse 3 in the KJV. What profit? hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun. One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. <clears throat> In some ways, this could, uh, if you haven't taken your medication, <laughs> this could get, cause some depression, because basically it's saying that everything is meaningless, up unless... It's uh, done with the, as it says here, uh, if it's done with the guidance of God, with a focus on God, there's meaning. Apart from that, everything in life has no meaning, no value. Uh, so he says, what profit um, hath a man of all his labor, which he taketh under the sun? Uh, so everything that we do in our lives, how does it benefit? How does it profit us? All of our labor, everything we work for all of our lives. Is there any benefit really uh, in all of that? It says one generation passeth away, another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. Well, today my wife pulled out of a chest. Um, it was in storage a nice big photograph of my father and my mother and uh my mother died in 1986 december that was the turning point in my life where i thought i need to know what happens after we die i need to know the meaning of life the purpose and uh, that's when i started reading the bible and i learned the purpose of life and since then, my life has had meaning, and I've had joy ever since then because of it. Um, but, and, and then my father died maybe 10 years later. Um, but it's been so long, I almost forgot what they looked like. And I saw this photograph of them, and I was just thinking, how wonderful. I, want, I need that out. We need to put that up where I can see it all the time so I can not forget them. Uh, and then I have a son. He's 35 years old. We have these three generations, my parents, myself, my son. And, but guess what? Every generation will pass. It's just going on and on and on. And each generation dies away. And what are we left? What, what is there? And that's really the question asked right here. Uh, so let me look at that. In the Amplified, verse 3, What advantage does man have from all his work, which he does under the sun, while earthbound, while here on earth? One, in, one generation goes and another generation comes, but the earth remains forever. 
So these are things I've, we've probably all kind of pondered. You know, most people, uh, after we get past just little infancy and childhood, we start thinking some deep thoughts about the universe and life and the, these kinds of questions. So verse five now in the uh, KJV, the sun also ariseth and the sun goeth down and hasteth to his place where he arose. The wind goeth toward the south and turneth about into the north. It whirleth about continually and the wind returneth again according to the circuits. The, all the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, with, thither they return again. Um, so we're, we're getting some perspective from all these verses that uh, time just keeps on passing on. The, uh, the, the sun comes up, the sun goes down, the rivers flow, uh, and even generation after generation, even after we are gone, everything proceeds as if we were never here. I'm going to read that in the Amplified now. Also, verse 5, also the sun rises and the sun sets and hurries to the place where it rises again. The wind blows toward the south and circles toward the north. The wind circles and swirls endlessly, and on its circular course the wind returns. All the rivers flow into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place where the rivers flow, there they flow again. So uh, things just continue to operate. The, the earth is still spinning. All these things still go on generation after generation. And he's, I think he's really getting to the point of what is the purpose? Just as I asked myself in December of 1986, what is the purpose? Why am I here? What happens after we die? We start realizing that these, these, this is what's really, really important. This is what is essential. These are essential questions. And the answers to all these questions are found in the scriptures. Now, let me go on. Now, in the, back to the KJV, Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Verse 8, all things are full of labor, a man cannot utter it, the eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. The thing that hath been, it, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. Well, this is a verse that's quite famous. Nothing's new under the sun. Uh, the verse before it, though, is a verse that uh, Mormons use to propagate their, their uh, religious extra-biblical theology. This, you can't find this in the, in the Bible, but this verse here, they would say, would support their viewpoint that this... Uh, God is, was once a man, and then he became God, and then more men will become gods, and it goes on and on and on. New, uh, it's a cycle. It says in the verse, it says, the thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done. So it's just a continuous recycling of everything. Uh, a world's cr created, uh, there's humanity, there's the Savior, the world's redeemed, and then another God, uh, another creation, another God, another Savior. That's how Mormonism believes it goes. And they would use a verse like this to support that. Uh, but that's not what it's talking about at all. It's uh, when it says, the thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. Uh, I, I was talking a lot about this point uh, in 
when I finished that study on uh, early church heresies. The heresies that we discuss today, and we, we identify it and point it out to everybody, I say, this is not biblical Christianity. This, this is why it's error. Well, guess what? There's no new thing under the sun. The, the heresies that we see today, we can trace back to ancient history. There's no new thing under the sun. Let's, uh, let's look at this, these verses in the Amplified. It says, That which hath been is that which will be again. And that which has been done is that which will be done again. So there is nothing new under the sun. <laughs> now we'll go to verse 10 in the KJV. Is there anything whereof it may be said, See, this is new. It hath been already of old, which was before us. Now we talking about here, I think you can say that would be true in terms of philosophical things. Now we know that there's new inventions, there's new technologies all the time, uh, but they're not really new. They're just discoveries of things that already existed. You know, uh, learning to tame electricity and use it for to benefit mankind. Uh, use uh, uh, learning how uh, uh, the airways can tran uh, transmit, uh, you know, our communication. It was they were there all along. We just didn't know how to put it together. It's not new. We just finally grasped it and began to understand it. So even though it's not, uh, we, we think they are new things, but they're not really new. We're just discovering what already was there. And this, let's go to back to the KJV. It says in verse 10, is, is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is new. It hath been already of old, which was before us. There is no remembrance of former things, neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are to come with those that shall come after. Now, that's an interesting verse. I'm not sure I understand that exactly. Uh, we, we do remember things that have happened in the past since man has been recording history. We don't remember everything, everything of course. Not everything is perfectly uh, saved and recorded for posterity. Uh, but it's not like man forgets everything. But man does forget a lot in terms of learning their lesson. There's a saying that if you don't learn from history, you're doomed to repeat it. If you don't learn from the mistakes of history. And so therefore, history repeats itself. The mistakes of humanity continue to repeat themselves. Maybe that's what it's saying that there's no remembrance of former things. Let me see how it says it in the Amplified. There's no remembrance of earlier things, nor also of the later things that are to come. Uh, there will be for them no remembrance by generations who will come after them. All right. So now we'll go to verse 12 in the KJV. It says, I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. And I gave my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. This sore travail hath God given to the sons of man to be exercised therewith. So he tried. King Solomon, he worked at it. He sought wisdom. He studied. He pursued knowledge. Uh, knowledge, understanding, wisdom in that order. Knowledge simply means that there's a verse in here, and I say, do you know what uh, Romans 6.23 is? And you say, you say, well, yes, Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So you, you know it. You have knowledge of the verse. Now, do you understand the verse? The understanding is a step above knowledge. Do you understand the meaning of that verse? It means that uh, because of sin, man's all destined to die or be condemned and die. And then we die the second death, the lake of fire. But 
the gift of God. Jesus, God offers a gift to us, eternal life, as a free gift through faith in Jesus Christ. So I can go to heaven by simply by trusting Jesus Christ and receiving the free gift of salvation. Now, that's how you understand the verse. Now, what is wisdom? You've got knowledge, understanding, and then wisdom. Wisdom means you apply it now. Okay, now you know the verse, you understand the verse, will you accept it? Will you believe it? Will you apply it to your life? Will you put your faith in Jesus? Will you trust him and receive the gift of eternal life and salvation? See, Solomon, he sought knowledge, understanding, and wisdom for his whole life. And that's kind of like part of what he's, this book is about is his efforts in all these things, and yet, he considered it all to be vanity. All those things that were, as it says in verse 2, all that is done without God's guidance is vanity. That's in the Amplified Version. Okay, uh, let me read this portion in the Amplified. We're starting with verse 12. It says that they, in the Amplified, it, it has a title for chapters and sections, subtitles. And chapter one in the Amplified, the um, publishers, the translators, they titled this, The Futility of All Endeavors. And then in this particular portion, beginning with verse 12, it says, The Futility of Wisdom. And so it says, I, the preacher, had been king over Israel in Jerusalem, and I set my mind to seek and explore by man's wisdom all human activity, that has been done under heaven. It is a miserable business and a burdensome task which God has given the sons of men with which to be busy and distressed. So it can be exhausting. Personally, I've, I've uh, learned uh, and uh, reach the point where the endeavor, the effort, the work, the, the laboring for knowledge, understanding, and wisdom, laboring to understand the scriptures, uh, for me, it's become a labor of love. It's not grueling, it's not worrisome, the way that Solomon is expressing it here. Uh, but toiling in anything can wear you out, even pursuit of knowledge and wisdom um, now let's read this back in the KJV verse, um, uh, verse 14. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun and behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. This is, this is really, like, it's just like piercing. It's heartbreaking. Um, I will tell you now, there's a happy ending to this story, just like there's a happy ending as when we completed the book of Job. But throughout, we're going to see that this, you know, you better take your medication. Otherwise, you could be depressed uh, in this study. It, it just seems like, Everything is meaningless. What's the point? Let's look at uh, verse 14 in the, in the uh, Amplified. I have seen all the works which have been done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity, a futile grasping and chasing after the wind. All right, so we'll go to verse 15 in the KJV. And it says, that which is crooked cannot be made straight, and that which is wanting cannot be numbered. I communed with mine own heart, saying, lo, I am come to great estate, and have gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem. Yea, my heart had a great experience of wisdom and knowledge, and I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that 
that this also is vexation of spirit. For in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. It's hard to even read it. The state of mind that Solomon is in there. Of course, it's going to be worth it, though. Endure through this. It's you know I don't want you to get your heart broken as we read this, but it's that's kind of the effect it's, it's having on me. It's heartbreaking to see the man who we, was the richest man in the world, who was famous for being the most the wisest man in the world, and at the end of his life, this is what he has to say. Let me read that in the the amplifier. I spoke with my heart saying behold I have acquired great human wisdom and experience more than all who were over Jerusalem before me and my mind has observed a wealth of moral wisdom and scientific knowledge and I set my mind to know practical wisdom and to discern the character of madness and folly in which men seem to find satisfaction I realize that this too is a futile grasping and chasing after the wind. For in much human wisdom, there is much displeasure and exasperation. Increasing knowledge increases sorrow. Whew, gosh, it's hard for me to even read it. I'm going to try to get into chapter two here, but, uh, I just want to encourage you to hang in there throughout this whole study because uh, we will find it, it will be worth our while. Just as it was a struggle to go through Job, through all of his suffering and all of his, the finger pointing and accusing of Job from his so-called friends. Uh, in the end, we look back and say, we learned much. And Job truly was the, the most righteous man. And uh, he, he did end up blessed and we we all learn from that experience and at the end of ecclesiastes we'll look back and say it was tough but uh we uh we were blessed because of because of this book let me go to chapter two chapter two in the kjv says i said in mine heart uh, oh, by the way, I'll, look, I'll just skip to the Amplified just for the title. The Amplified writers and the translators, they gave a title to chapter two, The Futility of Pleasure and Possessions. So I'll keep that in mind as we're going through this. So in the KJV, it says, I said in mine heart, go to now, I will prove thee with mirth, therefore enjoy pleasure. And behold, this is also vanity. <laughs> How did, do you have any pleasure in your life? What are the things that you do for pleasure? For me, I just I enjoy being with my wife, having fellowship with the saints, studying the Bible, playing golf exercising these are the things that i enjoy that give me give me pleasure uh, and there's other kinds of pleasures that i did in the past uh, uh, drunkenness you know getting high on drugs and my generation we introduced it to the, the way of life sex drugs and rock and roll i pursued all those pleasures too and, but he's saying that all these pursuits of any kind of pleasure in life, in the end, he says, this is all vanity. It's all uh, anything apart from focusing on God that's not being led by God. And he concludes, really, it's just vanity. You've wasted your time. So look at that. Um, and, and then it says, well, let me read it in the Amplified. It says, I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure and gratification. So enjoy yourself and have a good time. 
But behold, this too was vanity, futility, meaningless. So in the KJV, verse 2 says, I said of laughter, it is mad, and of mirth, what doeth it? I sought in mine heart to give myself unto wine, yet acquainting mine heart with wisdom, and to lay hold on folly till I might see what was that good for the sons of men, which they should do under the heaven all the days of their life. He found he's pursuing all these things to try to get some satisfaction in life, to f try to find the, the purpose, what will really will make him satisfied. Uh, let me read this in the, in the uh, Amplified. Verse 3, I explored with my mind how to gratify myself with wine, while at the same time having my mind remain steady and guide me wisely and how to take control of foolishness until I could see what was good for the sons of man to do under heaven all the days of their lives. So he, he is purposeful. He, he is really, he, he, these stages of his life, he's trying everything, seeking, is this what life's about? Is this what life's about? And all, uh, all the time, his conclusion is, no, that's not the purpose. That's not where I get can really have true happiness and joy and, and, and feel complete and satisfied. You know, it's like that saying that there's a, a God-shaped hole in your heart. You know something's missing. And Jesus fills that hole that makes you, that fills that void. This is what Solomon is writing about, talking about in his life, how he, he was trying to fill some vo void and get satisfaction in life. And he concluded that each one of these things turns out to be unsatisfactory, just vanity. Verse 4 in the KJV, I made me great works. I builded me houses. I planted me vineyards. I made me gardens and orchards, and I planted trees in them of all kind of fruits. I made me pools of water to water therewith the wood that bringeth forth trees. I got me servants and maidens and had servants born in my house. Also, I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. I gathered me also silver and gold and the peculiar treasure of kings and of the provinces. I got me men singers and women singers and the delights of the sons of men as musical instruments and that of all sorts. So I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. So he, was, he pursued wisdom, he gained wisdom, he retained wisdom, he went on and to pursue wealth and pleasures and entertainment, all the while keeping, keeping his wisdom. He thought, I'm going to read that portion in the Amplified now. I explored with my mind how to gratify myself with wine, while at the same time having my mind remain steady and guide me wisely, and how to take control of foolishness until I could see what was good for the sons of men to do under heaven all the days of their lives. I made great works. I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards for myself. I made gardens and orchards for myself, and I planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made pools of water for myself from which to water the forest and make the trees bud. I bought male and female slaves and had slaves born in my house. I also possessed herds and flocks larger than any who preceded me in Jerusalem. Also, I collected for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I provided for myself male singers and female singers and the delights and pleasures of men, many concubines. So I became great and excelled more than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. My wisdom also remained with me. It's 
seemed like, I mean, he certainly had a lot more in, in, in uh, material things and certainly probably in knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. He wrote the book on it far more than me. I suspect much more than you, but he doesn't have happiness. He doesn't have contentment. He concludes this is all vanity. It's all really meaningless in the end. Now the, let me see, back to the KJV. Verse 15. Oh, I'm sorry. I think, let me see, we're on verse. I guess, hmm. Verse 12, I think I'm on, let me see. Verse 12 in the, in the KJV, it says, and I turn myself to behold wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the man do that cometh after the king? <laughs> In other words, the king can get away with anything. Even that which hath been already done. Then I saw that wisdom excelleth folly, as far as light excelleth darkness. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walketh in darkness. And I myself perceive also that one event happeneth to them all. Yeah, we know what that is. It is appointed for man once to die, and then the judgment. Then I said, then said I in my heart, as it happeneth to the fool, so it happeneth even to me, and why was I then more wise? Then I said in my heart that this also is vanity. For there is no remembrance of the wise more than of the fool forever seeing that which now is in the days to come shall all be forgotten. And how dieth the wise man as, as the fool? Therefore, I hated life because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me. For all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Yea, I hated all my labor which I had taken under the sun because I should leave it unto the man that shall be after me. Verse 19, And who knoweth whether he shall be a wise man or a fool? Yet shall he have rule over all my labor wherein I have labored and wherein I have shewed myself wise under the sun. This is also vanity, pointless. Verse 20, therefore I went about to cause my heart to despair of all the labor which I took under the sun. For there is a man whose labor is in wisdom and in knowledge and in equity. Yet to a man that hath not labored, therein shall he leave it for his, his portion this also is vanity and great evil. I'm going to read verse 20 and 21 in the Amplified. It says, So I turned aside and let my heart despair over all the fruit of my labor, for which I had labored under the sun. For there is a man who has labored with wisdom and knowledge and skill, yet gives his legacy to one who has not labored for it. This too is vanity and a great evil. All right, I'll continue in the KJV, verse 22. For what hath man of all his labor and of the vexation of his heart, wherein he hath labored under the sun. For all his days are sorrows, and his travail grief. Yea, his heart taketh not rest in the night. This is also vanity. 
For all his days are sorrows and his travail grief. Um, I know people, some family, some friends, and they're really, really struggling with with life. You know, life is so grievous, so uh, laborsome, such an effort. I know some of them are just at the point where they say, I, I want it all to end. And they're just kind of like waiting for time to run out on them. And that's that's very sad. It's sad when people reach that, that point. I, I guess if a person suffers enough that they, 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 it may be sensible that they want the suffering to end. But uh, you look back and you know, on your life and say, it's just all vanity. What's the point? All my labors. I can't take anything with me. Someone else is going to inherit everything I've worked hard for my whole life. And I'm just wondering what was the point let me read it in the amplified starting with verse 22 for what does a man get from all his labor and from the striving and sorrow of his heart with which he labors under the sun for all his days uh, his work is painful and sorrowful even at night his mind does not rest this too is vanity worthless Okay, we're close to finishing this chapter. KJV verse 24 says, There is nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink, and that he should make his soul enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw, that it was from the hand of God. For who can eat, and or who else can hasten hereunto more than I? For God giveth to a man that is good in his uh, sight, wisdom, and knowledge, and joy, but to the sinner he, tr he giveth travail, to the gatherer, to gather and to heap up, that he may give to him that is good before God. This also is vanity and vexation of spirit. Well, I want to read those last verses in the Amplified and see how it's stated here. Verse 24, there is nothing better for a man than to eat and drink and assure himself that there is good in his labor. Even this I have seen is from the hand of God. For who can eat and who can have enjoyment without him? For to the person who pleases him, God gives wisdom knowledge and joy but to the sinner he gives the work of gathering and collecting so that he may give to one who pleases god this too is vanity and chasing after the wind so that ends chapter two well, let me sum up just just briefly here and uh, we'll pick up with chapter three next time but here we have King Solomon. He says that nobody had more wealth, more concubines, more pleasures, more wisdom. And yet everything he had, he's concluding that all these pursuits, all these accomplishments, he's, he's not satisfied. There's still something missing that only God can provide. Again, it's, it's that God-shaped hole in your heart. You've heard of that. Only Jesus can fill it. So that leads me to the, the final message of every broadcast is uh, I want you to know how to have this uh, joy, uh, joy like a river, peace like a fountain. Or is it the other way around? Peace like a river. 
joy like a fountain. Um, and not only for this time, this this time of this 70 years that we're, we're given, more or less, but, but for eternity, bliss and joy and happiness forever in eternity, that's really, that's really what this is all about. This time is just preparing us for that time. So what's going to happen after you die? The Bible says, life is like a vapor. It appears for a short time. Sometimes it comes suddenly, it comes quickly. Many times I'll see, hear a siren and see an ambulance driving by and I think, I bet the person in that ambulance didn't expect to be there today. So sometimes death comes suddenly, unexpectedly. What happens after we die? Are you ready to die and see what happens? I'm gonna tell you what the Bible says. The Bible says it is appointed for man once to die and then the judgment. We're going to all be judged by God. What are you going to say to God if he says, why should I let you into heaven? If you're like most people in the world today, even most people we find in churches, you're going to appeal to God uh, uh, based on your own performance, your own merit. You're going to say, God, I behaved. I was good. I even got religious. I went to church. I followed commandments. I gave to charity. Most people will appeal to God at the judgment, pleading their own righteousness, hoping it's good enough and God's satisfied. But if, that, if that's what your hope is in, your, if your faith is in yourself, then uh, God will just say, depart from me. I never knew you. The Bible says that trying to get to heaven through our own righteousness, that's man's way, but it's not God's way. God's way is understanding that you need the righteousness of Christ. You need... You, you can only have salvation and eternal life from Jesus Christ. It, it, man's way to get to heaven is striving and hoping it's good enough. God's way for you to get to heaven is Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way. He means, he means he's the way to heaven. He even said that he's the one and only way. He said, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. So Jesus claimed he's the only way for you to go to heaven. What are you going to do with that claim? You can say he's an arrogant egomaniac. You can say he's a fool. He's insane. He's a false prophet. You can say whatever you want. I say, I believe in Jesus. I believe he's the way, the one and only way. Jesus said, I'm the truth. This is the truth you need to believe. That you need to believe that getting to heaven through your own efforts is doomed to failure. You can never do it because God requires perfection and you'll fall short. The Bible, the Bible says that no one is perfect. Not, no, not one. No one is righteous. Not even one. So you need to believe in this truth that Jesus is the way. He is who you need to believe in. He's the truth. And he said, I'm the life. If you want life everlasting in heaven, he's the source of it. He's the sole source of life everlasting in heaven. And the Bible says, even though the wages of sin are death, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the gospel. The gospel just means good news. The good news is that Jesus is offering all of us a gift, eternal life in heaven. It's a free gift. He offers it to you now. If you put your faith in him instead of yourself, no longer believe that you can get to heaven through your own efforts. Reject that entirely and say, uh, 
I, I, I surrender. I give up. I cannot do it. I, I know that it's impossible. I need help. I need to be saved. And the Bible says there is one Savior, Jesus Christ. Put your faith in him completely. Trust him. Depend on him. And he promises you, you're going to go to heaven because of, of his faithfulness, his ability. Who is he, though? The Bible says that he is eternal God Almighty. The Bible says that he came down from heaven. The Bible says he was manifest in the flesh. He became a man, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. The Bible says the reason he became a man was to die for our sins. The Bible says he did die for our sins. He paid for all of our sins on the cross. That means you get to go to heaven because of what he did, if you'll trust him. Believe he paid for your sins. Receive the gift of eternal life. And he also said, I'll prove my claims are true. He said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. He is referring to the temple of his body and his death, burial, and resurrection. He promised he would, after he was crucified and buried, he would raise himself back to life on the third day and he did it. He did it because he, he walked bodily among 500 witnesses for 40 days and they saw him, they talked to him, they touched him, they ate with him. And it's that bodily resurrection that is the sign, it's the proof that proves he is God, he is Savior, he is the sole source of life everlasting. He has the power over life and death. And he will give you life everlasting if you'll trust him completely. That resurrection is what gives me confidence that my faith in Jesus is justified. So please put your faith in Jesus now. Receive the gift of eternal life and you're, you can be certain, you can be confident, you can be guaranteed you're going to go to heaven. And, it, and it's not based upon if you, if you succeed or fail, it's based on the fact that Jesus succeeded in paying for your sins. So trust him and make a comment on my video here right now. I'd love to hear that you put your faith in Jesus tonight. And I hope you like this study on Ecclesiastes. Uh, join me nightly for these Bible studies, 7 p.m. Pacific time, Bible talk with Brother Luke. Uh, bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.